don't have to deal with a white cat, am I right? the superhero pantheon now on this podcast we will take three episodes of the fox kids version of spider-man that aired in the mid 90s and discuss slash review this is not for pantheon eligibility but is our side project for the year my name is jerome cuson you can find me on twitter at jerome c 1985 you can find additional episodes of this podcast through apple podcast stitcher spotify and all of your favorite podcast apps through the real world we strongly encourage you to leave a four or five star review. So it's to help people discover this show and the great work that the folks at the real world are doing. If you would like to interact with us or send feedback, you can do so by following us on Twitter at hero Pantheon. My co-host for this week and every week is Brian DeBrain. You can find him on Twitter at Brian DeBrain. Brian, this week we are going, uh, we're discussing partners in danger. And it is a relief that you and I are, are not in danger, despite the world being a, a giant hellscape, that you and I are uh, still pretty safe these days. For now, for now, considering my past jobs, who knows, but let's just say that I've been kind of safe for it from right now. But uh, yeah, these uh, these three episodes, these um, the first three episodes of season four, I would say I would call the rise of Felicia Harding. AKA the black cat. And it kind of starts here a little bit. It really starts in episode two, but the, the groundwork kind of starts here. And uh, this episode is really interesting because uh, we kind of see this different side of J Jonah Jameson. And uh, I don't know. I can't remember, but was, is he still married? They never really identify him as being married or not, but I will say the partners in danger chapter one guilty is probably my favorite of the uh, of the episodes that we have reviewed so far, like I'm willing to say that this is one of my favorites. I think for a lot of the reasons that you mentioned, in terms of we explore J. Jonah Jameson's character a little bit, this is just like there are some there is some connective tissue to other things that are going to be happening later. But I love the fact that this feels like just a one off, and it kind of makes me wish that we had gotten more of these kinds of episodes that were kind of one-offs, but I really did like this episode a lot. Uh, this episode is entitled Guilty, and it it does connect to other things that have happened, but not to an extreme degree. I, I think this episode is so good, Brian. Not even Tombstone's presence can anger me. That's how good it is. Yeah, because he uh, surprisingly showed up at the end, but that was kind of like, oh, yeah, he's the he's the enemy of uh, the reporter guy, so of course he's going to show up at the end. But, yeah, basically what happened is the, the – I'm trying to get his name again – the reporter guy that was framed by Tombstone before, he's framed again, and he's actually caught and thrown in jail, and Jameson is trying to fight for his name. And, of course, he's, he's like, Spider-Man must be in on it, blah, 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 and then he's asking for Peter Parker's help, and I guess he goes back to his old persona – of him, like his old detective persona called Jigsaw. And uh, what's really funny is that, like, he goes to his old stomping grounds and stuff like that. But when he walks in, people don't recognize him as Jameson. They just seem to be like, oh my God, it's Jigsaw. I haven't seen him in years. And I'm like, haven't you been watching the TV? He's like one of the investors in Oscorp and one major player in like the board and everything. Like, very weird kind of way they kind of interpret it. Like, I guess all these people that he owes in the past really don't pay attention to where he was in the future and that he's J. Jonah Jameson. So I guess it's kind of like this, again, this idea that you have Peter Parker, Spider-Man, Felicia Hardy, Black Cat, and it's like they can't put two and two together and they can't figure out that Jameson is Jigsaw except for or, the people that really know him. Or they do recognize him as Jameson, but they're taken aback so much that 
they see him as Jigsaw Jameson, and it's basically that Jameson has a secret identity, which is the one thing he probably would never want to have. But I uh, I really like the stuff that involves him. I think this is just a really uh, good – this is a good way to bring us back because Spider-Man is starting out the season just swinging around the city thinking about Mary Jane disappearing into the ether. We get Harry, who's super depressed. So, yeah, it's just, this is a very good season premiere, and I really, really enjoyed it. I think the Robbie stuff actually works out well. I did not like the previous Robbie-focused episode uh, because his kid was involved. His kid is in a little bit of this episode, blaming Spider-Man for what happened. But uh, this just came out across much better because there is an actual mystery. Like, how did Robbie get the gun? Why did the gun go off even though he didn't shoot it? Uh, so, yeah, just a lot of really good stuff in this episode. And I love the fact that they keep calling him Mastermind as well. Uh, that also amused me tremendously. Uh, also, it uh, it amused me tremendously. And one of the things that I wrote down is the idea that Jameson is actually on the right side, but only sort of because he still thinks that Spider-Man uh, somehow sets him up. Um, I also love that Peter Parker becomes a detective just like Batman. This is not the first Batman connection that we are going to be discussing this season, if you know what I mean. Yeah, because at, at one point he talks to Bruce. And uh, we'll get to that when that ep- when that happens. But I-, I was laughing my ass off when he looks at Bruce and says, "Boy, do we have it or whatever?" <laughs> you know what I mean? Just like, hey, "Hello, that's a connection." Yeah, I really liked uh, Alfonso Ribeiro coming back in as as Randy Robertson. And I don't know if you can tell, but it seemed like what they were going for, which I really liked, is this this internal struggle that kind of like reflects back to some of the previous episodes that we were not really fans of. But this idea that he has like little faith in the law. And something like this would really break his faith in the law and just, like, kind of just, like, forget this and, like, why do I have to follow these laws that don't, you know, like, that are uh, prosecuting me but not the real criminals out there kind of thing? And kind of like a, like a question of faith almost. And once at the end, Jameson does, you know, get the <laughs> the decision reversed, which I don't even know is legal. Uh, but, uh, you know, he does clear his name and the son is, like, kind of has this restored faith in the legal system. And I was like, OK, I like that little message right there because he looked like he was about to, like, say, fuck all this and just become a criminal for sure. You know, seeing his dad get, you know, get out of jail and the, the system does work, it kind of put that faith back into it. So I really like that little aspect to it. Also, you know, Jameson going around with that that hat. I don't know, man. I, I just kind of felt like they were doing like a Rorschach thing, but maybe it was just like a trouble with the detective thing with the hat and the the long trench coat because we've seen that so many times in the 40s and the 50s 60s those detective dramas and all that kind of thing the serials so i, I love the look of it and the idea of it i just kind of wish it kind of stretched out a little bit more i thought one episode was a little too compact because like we don't get to see like this jigsaw jameson again really which kind of sucks because i like this different aspect I'm, of the character. I'm fine with it i don't i don't like it if this was a multi-episode run, I don't think that I would appreciate it. I like this as we're going to tell this story. This is the only time that Jigsaw Jameson's going to be here. So I appreciated the the episodic nature of this aspect of the character. I do also like the fact that we get so, more interactions between Spider-Man and Jameson as well. I think that's always... Uh, when the show is at its best is when, because it's just, it's a lot of hilarious banter and yeah, just, just a lot of really good stuff in this episode. And, you know, you get a pretty good action scene at the end. Tombstone is there as, as uh, a friend of uh, Richard Fisk and uh, they seemingly are ready to capture Robbie and Spider-Man of course is able to make the save with Jameson presenting the evidence. Yeah. I don't playing a little fast and loose with the, uh, with the legal system. And uh, I'm not sure if Robbie's son should have any faith in the justice system, um, especially being a black man in New York city. Not sure that's something that he should ever have, but I, uh, I really like this episode for a lot of different reasons. And yeah, it's, there's the right amount of humor. There's, um, the right amount of action at the end and uh, yeah, just bringing a lot of different threads together, but still keeping things episodic. So uh, guilty is really, really good. Uh, I wanted to note here, um, starting with the, this episode of the first episode of the season four, I'm looking at it now. And this, this next run of episodes that we're reviewing, there's at least one female writer uh, on each episode. So I'm just getting a solo female writing credit. So I was like, wow, this really had some changes. You can kind of tell where they're going this season, because you can tell the female characters are very much, I would say, uh, 
written better in this season compared to the, to the season prior. And you can kind of tell with that, like, with the changes with what's coming with Felicia Hardy. So I'm glad we kind of have this new change in direction and kind of have that female uh, it uh, is, uh It is it. desperately needed because I think this the female characters have been very underdeveloped. And even in this situation, I don't think that other than Felicia Hardy, I don't think we get a lot of development of other female characters. But just getting Felicia Hardy something beyond being either a damsel in distress or being a love interest. I mean, it's just nice that she gets her own background, that she kind of gets to be her own person, as that is what happens in episode two, which is entitled The Cat. Um, The cat, not the black cat, we are first talking about the cat, who is Felicia Hardy's father. And uh, he is a huge part of uh, uh, committing crimes, uh, part of the super soldier serum plotline that is uh has been such a huge part of captain america and marvel but we don't really get to see a lot of captain america in this episode necessarily but brian i know that you had to be excited that red skull was in this episode yeah very very brief but it looks like this is kind of like a loose tie-in to the x-men episode where wolverine teamed up with captain america because it looks like it's still the same like animation, I know it's the same animation style as like both shows, but like it looks like they kind of singular formed it together to make it look seamless. I don't know if you remember that episode from X Men, but like I just thought of like, oh yeah, this must be the start of that, where then Captain America meets up with Wolverine later on in that World War Two adventure in X Men. So I like that little again the connections here, but I wasn't a big fan of the way uh, they turned him into Captain America because uh, the way they do it in the movies is like the best way to do it. Just put him, strap him down put him in a machine, put the serum in him, and let him just grow. Here they put him in this, like, bath that looks like the, I don't know, like some goo or something, and then they electrocuted the goo, and then he just became Captain America, like he just grew all of a sudden. It's kind of weird. I wasn't the biggest fan of the way they did it. I guess they were going to, were like, a, kind of like a Frankenstein kind of sci-fi feel to it, but it just doesn't really click the way that the movie does. So that's kind of my one critique about that one scene. It's just the way it kind of played out. I was like, eh. Much prefer the movie version. But the idea is that John Hardesky, Felicia Hardy's father, thought he was working for the Allied powers or the Allied forces. And uh, it turns out he was working for the Nazis and they were tricking him the whole time. And his power is that he can rem- he's a, he has a picture perfect memory so he can remember anything he sees. So he sees the formula on the on the board, memorizes the super soldier formula. Uh, and then, you know, he goes on the run because he realizes that, you know, that he was being used by the Nazis. So that's kind of like the backstory. And then he finally gets caught by, like, S.H.I.E.L.D. or whatever, and he's been, what, incarcerated for, like, the last 20, 30 years or something? I think that's the idea, is that he was on the run for a little bit, and then eventually he was uh, he was caught, and that's kind of how we, we find him in this episode. Uh, we get a lot of Doc Ock in this episode, too, as he is threatening the Hardy family and threatening to expose them eventually. Uh, Kingpin naturally becomes involved. And yeah, this is just an opportunity to explore Felicia's family and her background, which is something that I think is desperately, desperately needed. But Brian, uh, we buried the lead a little bit. Uh, we we have the return of the chameleon, but chameleon is missing a very prominent part of himself as he no longer has to wear a belt in order to shapeshift. And all I could say is, Brian, Thank God, because it was a it was a point of annoyance with the two of us. And I'm glad that they finally wrote that part out. So now I think it creates an air of mystery to, oh, is this the chameleon? I very much appreciate that. So, yeah, good stuff. So, yeah, uh, it seems like there was like a bunch of complaints by probably viewers writing into the show for the first three seasons. Be like, we can easily tell he's the chameleon. How come all the other characters can't tell that the button is on his fucking belt? So obviously they took that note like, okay. You want some changes? We'll make some changes. And they changed it up, and now he can just kind of change into anybody. And uh, it's really good because it kind of adds, like you said, that era mystery. I don't know if this is kind of like a plot hole or whatever, but like once they get, because the basic idea is that Kingpin finds out that her desk is alive, and he wants the super soldier serum, and he knows Langston can kind of like take that serum and kind of reform it and update it. So he he breaks uh, uh, the cat out, but the the thing is he puts the chameleon in his place. So I'm thinking like, God, after like the the next two or three episodes, I keep thinking like, is the chameleon still in jail pretending to be Hardesky and fucking Kingpin just uh, like abandoned him? Because like, that's what it seems like. 
I mean, that kind of makes it funnier, doesn't it? The fact, of course, Kingpin would just leave him to die. And yeah, uh, we also need to point out just how involved Shield is in all of this. I love that at one point they ever at, they ask, "Have you heard of Shield?" And it's like, boy, in 1994, 95, 96, 97, maybe not, but in 2022, of course, people have heard of Shield thanks to how prominent Marvel is these days. Something that I, I, I mentioned in the previous episode was the fact that Peter Parker was kind of uh, being a detective like Batman. He's doing a ton of research, Brian, in this episode. Just so much trying to figure out what's going on with Hardesky and all that jazz. Just a ton of really, uh, really interesting stuff. So, yeah, uh, Peter Parker getting to uh, getting to be a little bit of a scientist in some ways. Yeah, and uh, I love the little research stuff he does with like going through all the past pictures. Of Ardesky and noticing that Nick Fury's in each and every picture. So he starts putting the pieces together, little things like that. And then, of course, you got to make fun of some of the technology. Like, he has an amazing color printer for 1997. Just amazing size and pristine picture quality. No streaks, no ridges. Just amazing. From there, I guess, I think they skipped some stuff. Because did you notice, like, there's, like, a big gap of, like, information between the two and three? Episodes two and three? Yeah, I think that it feels like there was it feels like there's a lot of clunkiness in the episodes for this week and for next week. I think it's even more noticeable next week because there's a lot of plot in a number of those episodes. But yeah, I could definitely see that being the case. And part of why part of the challenge, I think, is just you're trying to get so much plot across at this point. You're trying to get so much. You're trying to get us connected to who the black cat is giving them the mantle even, I think is super, super important because at this point, Felicia is not the black cat until we get to later in the episode and into the next episode, but we do get Doc Ock kidnapping Felicia, Spider-Man finding her room empty. And he's super sad because yet another woman in his life uh, has been kidnapped and he is uh, very much left alone. One of my favorite quotes, Brian, this is the most American of quotes. I may have been a crook, but I'm not a traitor to my country. That is chef's kiss. Many people would say that's one and the same, but you never know these days. I mean, look, it's it's certainly very conceivable, but that is episode two. I think episode two is a bit of a step down from the previous one. But again, I really love the fact that Felicia Hardy gets to have some background, gets to have a little bit more agency. Uh, we got we kind of get some background on the cat character, and she will be even more prominent in the next episode. I just I really appreciated what they were able to accomplish in such a short amount of time. And again, we have a lot of the kingpin and uh, and Doc Ock involved as well. Good stuff. Yeah, you can tell it's it's the rise of Felicia Hardy coming up because uh, the thing is, like when I mentioned like the missing information at the beginning of episode three, she's already the black cat. And, you know, thinking back, like, there's only 11 episodes compared to the 14 episodes of the previous two seasons. So I'm thinking, like, there may have been an episode penciled in between to show her taking the serum, her getting trained by her father, having that connection with her father, and having that reconnected tissue again. But all of a sudden, at the beginning of episode three, we just jump into them, like, they're reunited, they're reconnected. She's got the serum already, she's dressed as the black cat, and she seems to have all this training already, so they do this big time jump. It feels like, but again, it could have been they had that episode penciled in, they were on a budget, 11 episodes only, so they had to cut it out is what I'm assuming, because it feels like that's that's like a whole missing episode right there. And it feels like it would have had a little Spider-Man in it, but it would have been focused on more on Felicia and her father, which I would have loved because I want I wanted more of that, that you know, connected, like them reuniting and all that kind of thing. Because when they reunite, that's kind of like a shock and awe kind of feel, but then they jump to the time jump, or does the chi- time jump. And they're just reconnected. So I kind of wanted to see them reconnect and go through that journey. But it looks like they just cut the episode. It's a bit of, it's a bit strange, I think, the fact that we do have the time jump. But we do get some very, let's just say, there is a strong connection between what you would see here and maybe a little later on the Fox Kids, uh, the old Fox Kids time slot. Because we do get some uh, Black Cat and Spider-Man flirting and kissing and there's a point when uh, she kisses him and is going to take his mask off, but then says she is going to wait until they can both do it consensually. So that is a, that's very much appreciated. Uh, we get Spider-Man kind of running away. Um, Shield trying to capture him because they want to know what's going on. They want to get Hardesky themselves. We get Landon improving the super soldier formula to the point where Felicia 
can pr- pretty well hide her identity in being Black Cat because it's not just the fact that she is wearing a, a mask, but she physically becomes a bigger person because of the super soldier serum. So I liked how they kind of, they hid the fact that, you know, she was not going to be uh, Felicia Hardy, but that she was the black cat. So I like the way that they differentiated that. So I, that it was appreciated. Love the transformation and the look because it goes from her blonde hair to this white, uh, very, very white distinctive hair. Like, they probably added some shading to it, but the way that it just contrasts with the black suit, it just looks popping. Like, the colors are popping. They drew, they drew well in it. And then, uh, man, the sexual tension between Spider-Man and Black Cat. My goodness. My, my goodness. Uh, this is probably why, as I've gotten older, I've appreciated this season in particular more because I love this version of the Black Cat. I'm not really, like a, like, a comic fan of the Black Cat character. I just love this interpretation of it in this particular season. And I think you can tell because you got to give credit to the voice work here. Uh, Jennifer Hale, like you can tell, like she went from like the damsel in distress to being her own woman and being like, you know, like I can handle my own. And they always have these jokes like Spider-Man is always like, uh, let me help you out here. It's a little too heavy for her. And she just lifts it up like it's nothing. And she's like, maybe I don't need help. And then, you know, eventually at one point, I don't know if it's this episode or the next one where Spider-Man goes, man, maybe I'm more of a chauvinistic male pig than I thought. And I was like, God, thank you for this fresh, new, like, kind of take. And it's very refreshing. And you can tell the female influence in the writing. Basically, this is when Felicia Hardy is, like, in charge. And it's just, like, feels like a female writer right there, like, speaking. You know what I mean? And it's so different. And I think because of the fact that she can stand up for herself and it just kind of brings this different dynamic that, like, Spider-Man almost becomes, like, a side character in the season. I feel like... Felicia Hardy steals the show. I can definitely see that. I think that there are times when it does feel like a lot more of the focus is on Black Cat, and I think that is very much a positive thing. I think that the things that I love about this episode especially is that there is so much focus on her relationship with her dad and the fact that she gets to be the one uh, to save him. We do get a Nine Lives joke, which I kind of rolled my eyes at because I feel like that's just what you do, but they did it. We get John destroying the formula so that nobody else can be a uh, a winter soldier, so to speak. And uh, this makes Landon and Kingpin very, very mad. And uh, eventually the ship that they're in goes boom. Uh, Doc Ock does happen to have a parachute. The parachute game in this uh, is very, very strong. So Doc Ock will, of course, be back. But John tragically has to leave the Hardy family. And Spider-Man sends him off with S.H.I.E.L.D. But this time, John is kind of willingly going back. And again, there's a lot of agency that's involved here. Um, Some self-determination that John is doing this on his own. And uh, yeah, Felicia at least gets to know that her father is alive and well with somebody that is not Kingpin or one of the other villains. You could tell that's a female writer. Because I feel like if that was a male writer... She would have just taken the mask off and kissed him, and then it would have been the thing. But the idea of consent, that's very much like a female rider thing, man. Because, you know, this, with male riders, you know, that the, the female gaze and all that kind of shit, that comes from male riders. So I feel I like... I mean, certainly in 1994, 5, 6, and 7, I think that's... I think men are much more aware of consent than they used to be, but certainly 30 years ago, not as much. Yeah, and I felt like that's a big, like, clearly that a female writer help with that scene you know it would have been completely different if it was just male writing that final scene with Hardesky and then Felicia and the mom just all at the fireplace that was great drama man so what I think what I really liked about all this is not necessarily action but like the melodrama of it all and I'm not like always into like dramas and stuff like that but when you got like really complex relationships like this and you tie it into like a comic book sense I think it really enhances it and then the melodrama kind of becomes like not too over the top, but so good that it's like, you know, good, good drama. And I think that whole idea with the Hardesky family and the, and, you know, reuniting with the, her, her daughter and Felicia finally, finally having peace with her father. Um, I thought that's great stuff, great writing. And I think that's why I really like the Black Cat arc so far in, in season four, just because we get to see this character arc and we get to see like past characters and like past history of it all and how it ties it with S.H.I.E.L.D. and Captain America and then this, you know, this 
goodbye you know what i mean the sad goodbye so kind of reminds me of that episode of the simpsons where <laughs> homer's mom comes back after being on the run for so long and then she has to leave again but willingly so i will say i really like these three episodes and i think the thing that i liked about these three episodes and this is going to extend into next week what we don't have as good of episodes to talk about is the spider-man black cat dynamic i think it continues to work and it's one of the real highlights of this season so I want to emphasize that because it's going to be really important too, especially when we get to next week. But in terms of anything else to say about this week, all right, Brian. So we have completed our conversation on the first part of the fourth season of Spider-Man. Next week, we will be back to discuss episodes four, five, and six. And uh, this is going to be a rough one. That's all I'm going to say. I'm going to warn you now. It's going to be rough. But we will be talking to you again next week. For Brian, my name is Jerome. Thank you so much. Be safe. So do you think Jameson went on to be like the jigsaw killer and started killing people in like the most elaborate ways possible?